I will now turn it over to our session moderator, Caleb Berkemeyer. Thanks, Maynard. On behalf of the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center and Transcend Inc., I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar. This is the second uh, episode in our Lessons from Case Law series where we are taking a look at important concepts from the ADA uh, from the perspective of how they've been interpreted by the courts. So we thought this would be an interesting way for people to learn about or reinforce that, that knowledge and also come to understand how, how the courts are, are talking about these concepts. I'm going to introduce today our presenter, Rachel Weisberg. Rachel is a staff attorney at Equip for Equality, where she has represented hundreds of clients in individual and systemic disability discrimination cases under Titles 1, 2, and 3 of the ADA and analogous state and local laws. Rachel enjoys providing in-depth client counseling services as well as direct advocacy services in administrative and judicial forums. Rachel also manages Equip for Equality's Employment Rights Helpline, which aims to expand employment opportunities by providing legal and practical advice to applicants and individuals with disabilities. Rachel is a frequent trainer on the disability rights laws and speaks regularly at national conferences and on webinars. Prior to Equip for Equality, Rachel worked for the Civil and Disability Rights Bureau of the Illinois Attorney General's Office and as a law clerk for Chief Judge James G. Carr in the Northern District of Ohio. Now, before law school, Rachel was an information specialist for the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center and we're pleased to have her back with us for this webinar series and for this second episode. Rachel, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Caleb, and thank you, Maynard. Um, I am really thrilled to be back uh, for this three-part series and um, really so glad to be partnering again with the ADA Center. As Caleb mentioned, I did work there before when going to law school, so it's fun to reconnect with some of my old friends. Um, and also really glad that we have the opportunity this today to talk about effective communication in the criminal justice system. Um, this is a really important topic. Um, it's one that I've been working on um, um, for the last decade or so, and we'll talk about th that case as we move forward in today's um, webinar. So some quick housekeeping before we start. Um, this session is available for um, 0.75 hours of continuing legal education credit for attorneys. Um, Equip for Quality is a CLE provider in Illinois, so we absolutely can give anybody who's an Illinois attorney 0.75 hours of CLE. Um, if you are an attorney in a different state, um, we've had some information given to us that other states will accept um, our CLE certification. We can't promise, but it's worth a shot. So what I need you to do if you are an attorney participating in today's session, just send me an email following the session confirming that you listened to the whole thing and um, I will uh, get you um, hooked up with a CLE certification. Okay. okay, so here's the plan for today. Um, and I'm sorry, I think I'm supposed to be announcing the slides too. So right now we are on slide 16. Um, the plan for today is that we're going to start with a refresher on the ADA's effective communication requirements. And then we're going to really do a deep dive into how these effective communication requirements have been interpreted and applied in two um, kind of areas of criminal justice. We'll start by looking at law enforcement and then we'll move on to look at correctional facilities. And in each of those, there's a number of things that we picked out that I, we think are pretty unique to those different, um, those different areas. And at the, at the end, we'll recap the lessons that we've learned. So moving on to slide 17. Um, so uh, anyway, as a quick refresher of the effective communication requirements, remember that entities that are involved in the criminal justice system are going to be covered by Title II um, of the ADA as state or local government facility uh, entities, um, the Rehabilitation Act, or both. And also recall that we've got this general requirement under the ADA called the effective communication requirement. And what that says is really that any covered entity has to provide auxiliary aids and services services when it's necessary to communicate effectively with people who have communication um, disabilities. 
Okay, so what are auxiliary aids and services? Really, they're, they're things or devices that help make information and content available. Um, so the, the ADA gives us some examples. Um, and just to name a few of the examples, things like providing information in Braille or in an accessible electronic format. Um, those are auxiliary aids and services. Providing qualified sign language interpreters, written materials, or using communication boards. Those are auxiliary aids and services. So the, 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 key, the, the question is, well, how do we know which of those auxiliary aids and services we need to provide to somebody who has a communication-related disability? And the key is really to consider the nature and the length and the complexity and the content of the communication and the person's normal mode of communication. So you can see how you have somebody who has a disability and they're going to need different types of auxiliary aids and services based on the complexity of the communication. So a typical example, we've got someone who's deaf. That person goes to a restaurant, well, they may be able to order with a pen and paper or through lip reading because that's a short, simple, relatively unimportant communication. But you take that same individual who's deaf and communicates primarily through American Sign Language and you put them in a doctor's office talking about really important medical information, well, a pen and paper is likely no longer going to be sufficient. That individual is going to need an American Sign Language interpreter, um, potentially. So another important principle that we apply for Title II entities is this concept of primary consideration. And that's a concept we keep in mind when deciding what auxiliary aid and service to provide. And primary consideration basically means that Title II entities need to give primary consideration to the choice of the aid or service that's requested by the person with a disability. And both the Department of Justice and the courts have said that what that means is that the individual's choice really has to be honored unless the entity can demonstrate that another equally effective means of communication is available or providing that accommodation or that auxiliary aid or service would result in an undue burden or a fundamental alteration. So this concept places a higher standard on Title II entities, whereas Title III entities are just supposed to really confer. Um, but it really, it, it, it's, an, it's an important Rachel, concept because people Rachel, with I'm disabilities sorry to, are, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we've lost our capture. Uh, give me a moment. I'm going to reconnect. Sure. Okay, here we go. And Rachel, you can continue. Okay. Um, and uh, at the bottom of, sli of, of this slide, there's a link to a Department of Justice guidance document all about the, you know, the general principles of effective communication, um, which of course come from the Title II regulations. So um, moving on to the next slide. Um, I want to kind of give a quick caveat before we jump right in, and that is, you know, these effective communication principles are going to apply broadly to people with all types of communication-related disabilities. Um, that said, you'll notice from today's presentation that the vast majority of cases um, have been about people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, I've tried my best to throw in a couple of other disabilities, but there's just not that much out there. But I wanted to make really clear that even though the cases are focused on people who are deaf and hard of hearing, these principles are going to apply to people with all different types of communication-related disabilities. Okay, with all of those caveats and that background, let's jump in and see how these principles play out in the criminal justice system. You know, law enforcement um, poses some pretty interesting and unique issues because, you know, oftentimes police officers arrive on a scene. The scene may be dangerous. There may be people who are engaging in violent and, and very dangerous conduct. Um, and so the question is, how does that interplay with the requirement that we need to provide effective communication? So a term that you'll see um, that we'll be kind of saying a lot today and that we hear and see in the cases is this term exigent circumstances. So that's, you know, when you arrive on the scene and something is you know, we need to act really quickly, either because of there's, there's an imminent risk of harm, there's some sort of danger. So as a preliminary legal issue, um, there's a question of, well, does the ADA even apply when you're entering this sort of exigent circumstances? Well, 
the Department of Justice and most courts say, yes, of course the ADA applies. The ADA applies to everything that a state or local government does, right? So it's going to apply to all aspects of law enforcement, even including communications that you have before an arrest. That said, certainly if there is a true exigent circumstance, then that might be a relevant factor when deciding what auxiliary aid and service has to be provided. Um, in my humble opinion, that is a, the correct legal interpretation, um, and it's also, again, the one that the Department of Justice and most courts say. Um, I do want to point out that there are a couple courts, it's the minority view, that have come up with this thing called the Haynes exception. And what that means is that they're saying that the ADA doesn't even apply to an officer's on-the-street responses to a reported disturbance before securing the scene and ensuring that there's no threat to human life. Um, it's kind of a, you know, a, a it's not the majority position, but it, it is the, the position in the Fifth Circuit, which includes Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. Um, okay, so what's our lesson? Our lesson is that regardless of the legal framework that we're going to work in, as a practical matter, law enforcement is going to communicate with people both in these kind of emergency exigent circumstances and in more routine non-emergency communications. And it's critical for law enforcement um, entities to really think through and create policies, practices about how to engage in communications in both those emergency and non-emergency situations. Um, I'm going to add in a bonus lesson here, and that is also to provide training, 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 and real life training to think through what to do in these situations. Um, okay, so let's look at a case that helps us kind of put this, um, make this a little less of a, of a hypothetical. Um, so in the Burkle case, Burkle versus Miami-Dade County, um, we have a, a plaintiff who is deaf, and he was pulled over during a traffic stop. Um, this individual did not use American Sign Language, but he requested an oral interpreter. Um, the officer didn't give him one. The officer instead offered to fingerspell in sign language, um, which the plaintiff explained he doesn't know American Sign Language. So instead they engaged in face-to-face -face communication, and the officer spoke really loudly. Um, during this encounter, he was given a field sobriety test and then ultimately taken to the police station for a breathalyzer and toxalyzer test. Um, but this individual file, filed an ADA lawsuit saying that during these police encounters, he was not given effective communication um, because he was not given this oral interpreter. Okay, moving on to slide 20. Um, in defense of the ADA lawsuit, the county argued, hey, you know, this police officer was engaged in this really exigent circumstance, and so this entire arrest should be exempt from the ADA, kind of relying on that exemption we just talked about. But the court disagreed. The court, which is the 11th Circuit, which is Alabama, Florida, and Georgia, they said, we're going to reject this complete exception under the ADA. Um, and instead, and I'm going to quote this language, they said, the exigent circumstances presented by criminal activity and the already onerous tasks of police on the scene go more to the reasonableness of the requested ADA modification than whether the ADA applies in the first instance. So, in other words, yes, the ADA absolutely applies, but, you know, given these unique exigent circumstances, it may not be reasonable to stop this activity and wait for an interpreter. Um, and that's exactly what the 11th Circuit found here. They said, you know, given these exigent circumstances, you know, this individual had a DUI stop on the side of the highway, it required on-the-spot judgment and some serious safety concerns, um, it was not in a situation where the police had to wait for an on-the-site interpreter to arrive. Um, the court also noted as a practical matter, waiting for an interpreter may have altered this individual's blood alcohol level and it would have altered the results and so it wasn't going to be reasonable from that perspective as well. Um, I want to emphasize that the court really emphasized that these circumstances of a DUI arrest on the roadside are really different from those of an officer in other situations, like at a school or at a police station. Um, and the court also noted that unlike a lot of individuals who are deaf, this individual's primary mode of communication actually was rip, lip reading, and he was able to speak um, with a speech impediment. So perhaps that factored into the court's analysis as well. Moving on to slide 21. 
Okay, so now that we know that in truly, truly exigent circumstances, we may not need to wait to provide the individual's specifically requested um, mode of effective communication. But my next lesson is that it is still really important that we don't overextend that argument that exigent circumstances require immediate action. Um, and this Taylor versus Mason case um, helps explain why. So this case involves two people. We have a deaf man named Mr. Taylor, and Mr. Taylor uses ASL as his primary mode of communication. And then we have Miss Vissing. Um, she's partially deaf, and she knows um, ASL as well. Well, there was an issue where the two essentially alleged that the other assaulted them. Mr. Taylor called the police. The police arrived on the scene. Mr. Taylor requested that he be provided with an American Sign Language interpreter, and the police called and, you know, requested an American Sign Language interpreter to arrive. So far, everything seems to be going okay. But the problem was that instead of waiting for that qualified American Sign Language interpreter to arrive, the police just moved forward and they used this woman, Ms. Bissing, as an interpreter. So Mr. Taylor um, filed an ADA lawsuit and the court ultimately found for the plaintiff by denying the law enforcement's motion to dismiss. And they said, you know, this was not one of these exigent circumstances where you had to move immediately um, and you could wait and not, you know, and not wait for that interpreter to arrive. You know, once the police arrived on the scene, there was no safety risk, there was no imminent threat to harm. Um, and so in this circumstance, even though, yes, it was a police arriving after a telephone call, you didn't have these types of exigent circumstances, and so the police absolutely should have waited for a qualified interpreter to arrive. Now, hopefully a lot of you are thinking, well, that doesn't seem to be the only reason this is problematic. Um, and taking us to slide 22, and that's absolutely right. Um, the ADA's regulations, of course, outline when it's okay to rely on an accompanying adult to facilitate communication. And they give two kind of two different reasons. One is that there's this emergency with an imminent threat to the safety or welfare of an individual. Well, as we just discussed, we know that wasn't the case. And the second is when an individual specifically requests the use of an accompanying adult and reliance on that accompanying adult is appropriate. Well, here, neither of those factors lines up, right? We know that the woman was certainly not an appropriate person to use. She was both accusing this individual um, of assaulting her and was being accused of engaging in an assault. Um, you can't really think of circumstances where someone might be less appropriate. And this individual, Mr. Taylor, never consented to the use. And so it was also a problematic interaction for that reason. Um, this case also gives us some information about the communication at the police station, because um, Mr. Taylor was then taken to the police station. He was given an interpreter who wasn't ASL certified. Um, as, as we all know, a ADA doesn't really speak in terms of ASL certified. It speaks in the terms of having a qualified interpreter. Um, but in any event, the man complained that the interpreter wasn't effective for him, wasn't really working out, and the city refused to replace the interpreter. And so looking at that primary consideration language, the court said, you know, when a law enforcement agency decides not to defer to a deaf individual's requests, the burden is going to be on the law enforcement to ensure that communications with a deaf individual are as effective as communications with hearing individuals. Um, as often happens after these types of decisions, this case um, settles, but gives us some really good guidance, I think, for law enforcement moving forward. Okay, we're going to wrap up, um, move on to slide 23. We're going to wrap up our law enforcement section with an in-depth review of a really comprehensive um, settlement agreement from the Department of Justice. Um, and for those who have heard my presentations before, I, I really like to look at Department of Justice as settlement agreements and really lots of different settlement agreements um, to help us come up with, you know, some real practical strategies to implement some of these legal processes because we can kind of learn the legal lessons from cases, but often the cases don't give us um, the, the real roadmap about how to implement some of these legal processes. And so the Department of Justice's agreement with the City of Philadelphia Police Department um, I think outlines really comprehensively um, certain things that police departments can do to ensure effective communication. So this um, 
We're going to start by looking at what the agreement said in terms of these exigent circumstances. And the agreement requires the Philadelphia Police Department um, to, to ensure that it's providing effective communication basically to the extent that it can. So it says that if there's an emergency involving an imminent threat to the safety or welfare of an individual, um, including law enforcement and including members of the public, and there's not enough time to make available appropriate auxiliary aids or services, then law enforcement personnel can use whatever auxiliary aids and services are most effective under the circumstances to communicate consistent with an appropriate law enforcement response to that imminent threat. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit more, moving on to slide 24. So essentially what that means is that if you, get, if you have these exigent circumstances, officers don't necessarily need to completely stop and secure that very specific auxiliary aid and service being requested. So like the Burkle case, the officer didn't necessarily need to stop the interaction altogether and wait for the oral interpreter to arrive. But that doesn't mean the ADA doesn't apply. It doesn't mean you can totally throw up your hands and say, well, there's no effective communication we can provide. It means we have to do the most effective thing under the circumstances. So even in those situations, we got to look at the most effective thing. And so the example given in the settlement agreement is maybe you can't wait for the ASL interpreter. Well, use pen and paper. You know, that's not the ideal situation. That's not what you're going to do under normal circumstances. But given the exigent circumstances, that might be the best that can be done. Um, but then this other point is really important, too. And that is as soon as there's no longer this imminent threat, there's no longer this exigent circumstance, Officers have to then go through procedures to assess someone's communication needs and provide the appropriate auxiliary aids and services to ensure effective communication. Um, also on slide 24, I have a link to the DOJ's agreement with another police department, the Columbia Police Department in South Carolina from 2016, and they have the kind of the exactly same language in terms of exigent circumstances. So I think this is a kind of a good starting point for law enforcement to look at when developing your own policies. OK, moving on to slide 25. Um, we're going to look a little bit more at some of the Philadelphia settlement agreement, because there's some other really great tips in here that we can learn from. Um, so what happened in this DOJ agreement is in addition to discussing the exigent circumstances, they created a whole process to engage in a communication assessment. And one thing that is going to be, that that's required is that personnel are going to use what's called a communication card. And it's something that can be used during routine interactions when there's no imminent threat. And essentially this communication card uses pictograms um, to communicate some basic information and to ask someone about their preferred method of communication. So I'm going to skip ahead to slide 26 for a moment, and I've got two pictures here about um, what these communication cards look like. So the one on the left has a number of different images that show kind of standard violations. And so there's a there's an image of a stop sign. Well, that stop sign that could be used to communicate, you know, that the person ran a stop sign. There's pictures of reckless driving, of a broken taillight, of a um, of somebody's license. Um, and then on the right, there's an image that says the best way to communicate with me is. And there's images of a sign language interpreter, of captioning, of writing, of lip reading, of something that says I cannot lip read, and so and something that says assistive listening device. So again, it's these cards that can kind of help to facilitate um, the, the communications during these routine interactions. Going back to slide 25 for a second. Um, the other important point that I like from this Philadelphia settlement agreement is that there's also a communication assessment form. Because oftentimes the communication is going to be you know, a lot more comprehensive and complex than that just initial communication. Um, and during those communications, it's important to make sure that we're providing the appropriate auxiliary aids and services. So this communication assessment form asks the individual what auxiliary aids and services are desired. And it really specifically lists the different possibilities. So it'll say interpreter, but instead of just saying interpreter, it will say American Sign Language interpreter, oral interpreter, signed English interpreter. And it clarifies that these accommodations, auxiliary aids and services, will be provided free of charge. Um, OK. Moving on to slide 20, 27, um, other p parts of this DOJ settlement agreement um, 
the Philadelphia Police Department agrees to give primary consideration to the express preference, so again, that language we've seen before, um, requires the police department to ensure appropriate auxiliary aids and services, including interpreters. Um, it ensures that interpreters are provided as soon as possible, and they say within typical business, uh, regular business hours, that that's, they're shooting for within one hour of the identified need. Um, the agreement recognizes that perhaps during weekend holidays or nighttime hours, it might be a little bit more than that, but it still needs to pro be provided within a reasonable period of time. So for law enforcement out there, you know, that interpreter is not going to show up within an hour um, if you call them for the very first time when you need them. What you're going to need to do is maintain a contract with a qualified interpreter agency or hire individuals um, who are available on that sort of priority basis, and that's what is spelled out in the GOJ agreement. The other thing this agreement does is it requires Philadelphia to update the electronic detainee tracing system, um, and that notifies law enforcement of a detainee's disability and preferred auxiliary aid. Um, also, of course, develop a training program, and there's some really specific requirements here about what type of training, both in terms of format and in terms of topic, and there was a monetary payment of almost $100,000 in this agreement. Um, okay, moving on and switching gears to the ADA in the correctional facilities. And we are now on slide 29. Um, and we'll talk about a number of interesting and recent cases and settlements looking at effective communication um, in correctional settings. Um, and the first lesson we have here is that when we're providing effective communication, it's important to consider both individually requested needs and systemic changes. Um, and we'll see kind of what that means and how that's applied in a couple of our upcoming cases and settlements. Um, so the first case here is the Disability Rights Florida versus Jones, and this is a lawsuit that was brought about disability uh, people with inmates with all sorts of disabilities, both mobility disabilities, people who are deaf and hard of hearing, and inmates who are blind and have low vision. And um, given that we don't have a lot of other cases about inmates who are blind and have low vision, we're going to focus on that aspect um, of the settlement agreement. So this case settled, and as part of the settlement, there are a number of both systemic changes that are going to be made to the Florida Department of Corrections and processes in place so that individuals can make individual requests. So just as a couple examples of how we're going to be pro providing effective communication. One is that materials that are being distributed, things like orientation materials, handbooks, signs, paper forms, all of those things are, have, to be, um, have to be provided in an accessible format. Um, there's also a discussion about, well, how, about, how do people who are blind or have low vision know if, um, if, if things are happening kind of throughout the, throughout the correctional setting? And so one agreement is, one part of this agreement is that talking watches are going to be per given to remind inmates about necessary events or ap appointments in certain circumstances. Um, individuals are also going to be provided, um, permitted to have plastic magnifying sheets as an accommodation, something that's not typically allowed but is required necessary for a lot of people to have effective communication. Um, the, law, the library and the law library are going to have additional um, auxiliary aids and services, things like magnifiers, a CCT video magnifier, large print books, and other resources. Moving on to slide 30. Um, and here we see some of the more systemic changes, uh, kind of the equipment pr um, acquisition. So this, this settlement it requires the the Department of Corrections that if they have a library, if, the, if their library has a computer, then the computer is going to have to have font enlargement features and screen magnifiers. Um, and, and at least one computer in the law library will also have JAWS software and training on that software is going to be available. So you can see how sometimes providing this type of systemic change in the acquisition of, of different technology is the way that they're going to provide effective communication. Um, also, upon request and need, there's going to be like a tape recorder to allow inmates to dictate correspondence, and there's going to be access to what's called inmate assistance. Um, law clerks or library clerks to essentially help people prepare grievances. Um, I have another reference on this slide to this case, Wells versus Thaler. And what happened in that case is that there was a blind inmate um, in Texas who requested um, screen reading technology software 
um, and also Braille and audio versions of different legal resources. And instead of providing those, he was given an inmate of his choosing to help him. Um, ultimately, in this particular case, the court found for the Department of Corrections, and the reason why is that they said they tried to get Braille and audio version of some of these resources and they weren't available, and they found that this inmate um, was able to obtain the other information through this kind of inmate helper. Um, and, I, and I bring this up because, you know, I just want to caution um, law enforcement or correctional facilities who are doing this from kind of overly relying on individuals to provide the types of um, auxiliary aids and services when there could be technology or other things to enable an inmate to be able to be independent. Um, and there have been some cases out there talking about how as a legal matter, if there is a device that would enable somebody to be independent and do something independently, then that's going to be preferable because it enables somebody's independence, which is important even in a correctional setting. Um, and then, of course, as a practical matter, um, Sometimes when we rely on other individuals, even when we rely on correctional officers, um, there could be just, you know, there could be problems with the implementation. You know, correctional officers have a whole lot to do. And so, you know, kind of giving this additional responsibility is not always the most effective way to implement some of these requirements. Okay, moving on to slide 31. Um, and we're going to look at a number of different cases about prisoners who are deaf and hard of hearing um, because, again, that's been where most of the litigation has been. And we see some common themes in the case law, and we'll kind of, we'll kind of go through all of these different themes. But the, the first lesson I want to share is, well, how do we decide when to provide American Sign Language interpreters? You know, correctional settings are kind of unique. We have individuals who are housed there 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week, and they need to communicate during that entire time. So, you know, do we need to provide an, an asylum interpreter all the time, or what do we need to do? Um, and kind of as a shortcut, there's been this concept coined in both the case law and in settlement agreements called high-stakes interactions. And what we're seeing is that, you know, courts and settlement agreements are saying, well, maybe we can kind of use this as a shortcut to say individuals who are deaf who communicate in, with sign language should be provided with ASL interpreters for all high-stakes interactions. Um, and the first, you know, one of the times we see this is in the McBride case. It's McBride versus the Michigan Department of Corrections. And this is a class action brought on behalf of deaf and hard of hearing inmates. It was really broad. It talked about all sorts of things that were happening in the correctional setting. Um, but one of the interesting things about this case is that the, the court actually found um, that they found for the class on a number of different, on three different things. So number one is they said that the Michigan Department of Corrections violated the ADA by failing to provide American Sign Language interpreters. And moving on to slide 32. And so the court actually ordered that the Department of Corrections had to provide American Sign Language interpreters for all high stakes interactions. So again, not a settlement, but a court order. So that was pretty, um, pretty important. And the court also said that that applied even um, for religious services, even though the religious services were voluntary programs um, and they were run by voluntary organizations, that they were still um, important programs that needed to have ASL interpreters. Um, so I mentioned that this is an issue that I've been working on, and so the next case on slide 32, Holmes versus Baldwin, is a case brought by my organization, and we settled it about seven months ago um, on the ADA's anniversary in 2018. And we also, you know, had an issue about, well, when are we going to have American Sign Language interpreters being provided for our class members whose primary language is ASL? Um, and we also adopted this concept of high-stakes interactions. So moving to slide 33. Um, so what are high stakes interactions? Well, high stakes interactions are essentially, um, it, they're, they're co um, complex, important communications where the consequences of missing these communications have really serious repercussions. And so the home settlement has a list of the different sorts of um, interactions. There are things like medical care, um, including dental vis vision, audiological, mental health, including therapy and group counseling sessions. Um, there's a narrow exception that we see from the Department of Justice's guidance about routine appointments without substantial conversation, like allergy shots, but most medical care would fall within this high-stakes interaction. 
also things like disciplinary investigations, educational programs, vocational programs, transfer and classification meetings, and meetings with the ADA coordinator to implement a communication plan. So can I encourage um, correctional settings that are out there to kind of use this high stakes interactions concept. I mean, it's not going to be 100% um, all you need to do, there's still individual inquiries that need to be made, but it's a nice kind of rebuttal, it's a nice like presumption um, to assume that if somebody uses ASL, they're going to probably need um, an ASL interpreter for these types of interactions. Okay, moving on to slide 34. The next lesson is pretty straightforward, and this lesson is that correctional facilities really need to be providing video phones to ensure equivalent access for individuals who are deaf. Um, you know, correctional settings, what we're seeing throughout the case law and throughout kind of recent settlements is that correctional facilities are really overly relying on TTYs, um, but there's a number of reasons that TTYs aren't providing equal access. Um, one is that TTYs really require someone to be able to speak English, and a lot of folks who are deaf aren't fluent in English, and they also just are kind of a burdensome technology. They take a really long time to communicate back and forth, and for that reason, they're becoming pretty outdated, but we still see them all the time in correctional settings. Um, so what we've seen in some of these recent cases is just the, the, the courts ordering the provision and settlements requiring the use of video phones. And so that McBride case out of Michigan, um, another one of the court's decisions was that the Michigan Department of Corrections was violating the ADA because it wasn't providing video phones. And they ordered that all video, that video phones have to be available for all deaf and hard of hearing inmates. Um, the, the court also said that, you know, look, the defendant's own witness compared using a TTY to sending someone a fax to their home versus an email to communicate, which I thought was a kind of good analogy about the difficulty of using TTY. Um, the other thing we're seeing in a lot of these cases is that correctional settings um, often use the defense of safety. Um, and, and, I, and I guess another lesson that I'd like to say is that safety is absolutely a critical component of any sort of criminal justice setting. Um, and it's certainly something that is, you know, that should be thought about. Um, but we are seeing this over-reliance. And so I'd caution um, covered entities out there, instead of just kind of deferring to a safety concern, really thinking through what is a safety concern and how do we address it. So for instance, a lot of the concerns about using video phones have been, well, how do we monitor it? Um, but courts have really pointed out that TTYs are, are monitored by correctional staff, and there could be ways to monitor video phone communications in exactly the same way. Um, perhaps you just need someone to help interpret some of the sign language. Um, but it's not necessarily a reason to completely accept it. So um, both the, McBr the McBride case and that home settlement are requiring the use of video phones. Slide 35, I just have a number of other cases where we talk about video phones, and I just want to point out that the Hire case, um, Hire versus U.S. Bureau of Prisons, in this case, in addition to, um, or actually instead of bringing this case under the ADA, there was a question about whether the failure to provide access to the video phone actually restricted an inmate's constitutional rights or First Amendment rights. And we see the same sort of arguments about why TTYs are outdated technology and concerns about security that the court says here are ex exaggerated response. And so again, of course security is a concern, but let's think through if there's resolutions about how to mitigate that concern. Um, moving on to slide 36. Um, another issue that we see is that information is constantly being communicated to inmates. So we need to think through how is information being communicated, how are they receiving notifications, and are those notifications accessible? So we mentioned earlier with, with respect to the Florida case that there were talking watches for blind inmates. Um, well, we see in the next, in this bearding case on slide 36, that there's also issues for folks who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, the bearding case was brought by an individual who was deaf, and he was constantly missing um, calls to go take his medicine. And the reason why is that this information was being communicated through the jail's alert system, which was all done over a loudspeaker. Well, you know, the court in a pretty quick 
quick analysis said, well, that's not going to be effective for this individual. He's missing this information. And so we see how that's being implemented on slide 37, both with that home settlement and the DOJ agreement with South Carolina, that um, correctional settings across the country are using both tactile alert systems and visual alert systems as ways to make sure that the communication is being done effectively. So just a couple of tips. You know, if we're using a visual alert system, it's important to remember to think through whether an individual will, have, will actually be able to see um, the visual alerts and to consider whether information is being relayed um, at a, you know, during a nighttime when someone's sleeping and how to get that information um, communicated that way. Um, our last topic, and one that also is kind of unique to the criminal justice system, is that we're learning from both the courts and settlement agreements that we need to affirmatively evaluate um, individuals' disability-related needs. And so, you know, we need to actually be proactive and develop a process to do so. And one of the legal cases that we learned this from is this case called Peer versus DC. In this case, we have an individual who is deaf who was incarcerated for 51 days and throughout that whole time had requested an interpreter um, and the prison staff really never assessed his needs and just assumed that lip reading and written notes were sufficient. And the court in this case actually said that it was a violation of the ADA as a matter of law by failing to affirmatively evaluate their needs um, and that prisons have an affirmative duty to assess the accommodation needs of inmates with known disabilities. So slide 39, so how do we do that? Well, we've got kind of two examples. The home settlement creates an entire process for how to enhance the screening of, how to kind of enhance the screening process to first assess whether somebody is deaf or hard of hearing, um, and then to use these third-party communication assessors to assess someone's communication needs and help develop a communication plan. Um, what we're seeing in the Disability Rights Florida um, case and settlement is that they've created a process where right at reception there's going to be an evaluation to identify whether somebody has a hearing, vision, or mobility disability and whether they have accommodation needs. Um, and any sort of verbal and written communication skills are going to be evaluated by a professional. So um, I would encourage folks out there to really think through what type of affirmative processes are in place um, to evaluate folks' needs. Um, so a quick recap of the lessons that we learned uh, pretty quickly today is that we want to create pro policies and procedures about how to communicate effectively during both exigent and not exigent circumstances, but we certainly don't want to overextend the argument that exigent circumstances require immediate action. We want to do training, training, we want to do training um, hands-on when possible. Um, we want to learn from comprehensive DOJ agreements. They're out there and they're good, so let's look at them. We want to consider systemic and individual needs. Um, of course, we want to install and use video phones instead of relying only on TTY. We want to make sure we're providing ASL interpreters and we can use that shortcut about high stakes uh, programs. And you know, we want to contract with interpreting agencies to make sure that we're getting people on a, on a priority basis. Um, we want to ensure that oral information is communicated in alternative ways and then of course develop a process to assess inmates' um, disability related needs. Um, so there's a lot of information we don't have. Uh, this, this program is not um, one where there are questions and answers, but I have my contact information on slide 41, my phone number and email, and I'd be more than happy to discuss any of these cases or chat with anyone, so feel free to reach out to me. Okay, well, thank you, Rachel. Uh, once again, it was an uh, episode with lots of great information, and if anyone has any further questions, you can contact Rachel. You can also contact us on slide 42 you'll see uh, our contact info. Um, you can contact the ADA National Network by calling 800-949-4232 and you'll be directed to your regional ADA center. And the National Network website is adata.org. Lots of helpful stuff on there. If you're in the Mid-Atlantic region, you can call us directly at 301-217-0124 and you can visit our website at adainfo.org. Um, also, keep in mind that session evaluations will be sent out for this session, so um, keep filling those out. We really do look at those and appreciate you guys giving us feedback. Uh, slide 43, for upcoming webinars and trainings, you can take a look at our training section on adainfo.org. 
And for the National Network, you can take a look at the events section uh, on adata.org. Slide 44. So uh, I want to thank everybody uh, and apologize for the technical details, but Rachel, I think you, uh, you, you, you handled it well. So thank you for that, and thank you everyone for joining us.